Hello and welcome to another episode of The Legal Geeks. Today we're here to discuss the classic movie, Jaws. But before we get into an actual discussion of the movie, I have to point out that Josh Gillen, my partner in geekdom, and I have both dressed for the occasion. Josh, I see you've got a special bow tie there. Can you tell me what's, what is that I see on that bow tie? Well, today I'm wearing a Bow Ties of Vermont Limited sailboat bow tie, <laughs> going with a nice, you know, Cape Cod uh, summer theme, uh, which also matches the artwork on the wall. So yes, uh, it's clear you're a sailing buff. I'm sure you didn't have to go out and buy that bow tie just for today. Uh, you have a background in sailing, right? Yes, I've been. My first time on the water was in a kayak in Lake Tahoe, and I was uh -huh. like three, three or four. It's actually a picture of it, and uh, so that that began the adventure. And for 21 years, uh, I've been involved in Sea Scouts, the maritime branch of the Boy Scouts. So I'm a very active sailor and very involved in youth programs for uh, aquatic activities. Very cool. I have to say I'm a sailing fan, but I prefer if other people are doing the sailing. My parents actually had a sailboat. I spent some time in Connecticut, and I loved it when they sailed on Long Island Sound, and I could relax. So I'm not an active sailor myself, but... Uh... You know, things like call out, um, that's kind of intense. That's a lot of work. Um, you know, being cold and wet in the middle of the night, navigating yes. gets, gets old fast, uh, watching... <laughs> You know, going near a place where, you know, say military ships take on ammunition, that can be a little stressful. You know, there there's all kinds of adventures to have out on the water. Yeah, um, I did that, the low stress sailing. That's my uh, preferred route. <laughs> good plan. And I say, today I'm wearing, this is my Door County t-shirt because uh, Door County, Wisconsin is known as the Cape Cod of Wisconsin. And having spent time in Cape Cod and on some of the islands in Long Island Sound and now in Door County, Wisconsin, I have to say that Door County is the prettiest. So I have to give a plug to my new home state and um, its adorable little resort area. So if you ever have the chance, you must check out Door County. One day I've done Cape Cod a couple times and uh, I've ridden a bike across Martha's Vineyard. Can't wait to do that again. And it's a, it's a wonderful place. I look forward to visiting. All right, good. Well, speaking of Martha's Vineyard, I think that actually has a connection to Jaws. So, Josh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the story of Jaws? Well, the film was you know, made on Martha's Vineyard. And so, you know, if you go through there, you can kind of see, you know, parts where it's like, hey, this is the Main Street. And... Uh, <laughs> And that's pretty cool to be able to go do that because it's, yeah. it's very quaint, very quaint, very pretty, and and it's you know very New England summer, you know yes. like everything that that you've dreamed in books and, and everything, and it, it's pretty awesome. I, I I'd love to go back, uh, and I understand why two recent presidents enjoy vacationing <laughs> there. Uh, Better than we go. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know. It's I, I I could understand the flack they get because of. The, the environment, but it, it is pretty awesome. I, 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 it is. Even, even though I'm on the opposite party, I do want to give them a free pass on that one because <laughs> I, I, I'd enjoy it too. Yes. Uh, but so it was, it was filmed there, and uh, the movie came out in 1975, and it first was a book by the late Peter Benchley, who, who passed away six years ago. And I, I took an oceanography um, class in, in college that actually focused on piracy. And um, there, there was a quote by Peter Benchley that if he had known, you know, like, you know, the amount of, like, shark hunting and, and that was going to take place and how endangered the animals were, he would never have written the book. Uh, and uh, so I, I think he felt bad about that. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it's a wonderful story of, you know, this, this <laughs> nautical adventure and, and everything that, uh, you know, that's centering around a shark. I read the book when I was in the fourth grade. And um, a lot's happened since then. That's a scary and there, book to read in fourth grade. I, I was pretty advanced, uh, and uh, <laughs> and so, but I mean, there there are some differences between the book and the film. Like you know, the way they kill the sharks more explosive in the movie than than in the yeah. book. Uh, Richard Dreyfuss's character in the movie is very likable, and he also survives in the movie. Um, Spoiler in the book, alert. He, and the book, he wasn't as likable because he had an affair with uh, the police chief's wife. And um, then he's eaten by the shark um, as well. So there's um, 
Um, but I, I remember reading that section in class uh, out loud about how he saw the shark's eye through a pool of his own blood. Oh. And, uh, and uh, or a cloud of his own blood. I believe it was the exact oh, yeah. <laughs> This is why I will not see that movie ever. <laughs> that was the fourth grade. It's a male, you know. It's one of those uh -huh. it's like cool. Uh, but then, <laughs> but Spielberg makes a rip roaring adventure, and it, it's you know this is where Spielberg really showed his chops as I am the adventure summer movie king, the it's blockbuster truly, king. It's the first one. It's the first yeah. summer blockbuster because this is 1975. You know, Star Wars. Would, Yep, and Star Wars is 77, and so you, you can definitely see, you know, it, it sets a huge, huge standard, and it was, it was awesome, because they recognized early on in filming, they felt the shark looked a little fake, and the way that they decided to make the movie terrifying was to not show the shark, so from the first attack, you know, Chrissy Watkins is out swimming, and all of a sudden, you know, you see her screaming out of control and getting thrashed around, and it scared the nation senseless, you know, and it's like, yeah, you know, it's like it starts out with the blonde college girl going skinny dipping, and, you know, it ends with her brutal, you know, death, and like, that's the first five minutes, and... And it's and it's like you know rock on Stephen you know it's like uh, you know set the high bar on you know, I'm going to make movies for the next forty years oh. and they're going to be awesome and I'm going to set a really high bar and, and this is this is where he showed his chops because then we had Close Encounters of the Third Kind, mm -hmm. um, eighty one is is uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark you know and he just kept you know you know pummeling uh, you know. You know the, the world with, with these fantastic movies, uh, E.T. '82, yes. and so so why are there people jumping out of their chairs or crying uncontrollably with you know because a puppet aliens leaving a little boy <laughs> and that's able to emotionally devastate the world? It was. Yeah, getting President Reagan's attention and saying like wonderful things about it. it's like you know that was actually pretty. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful visual storyteller, and and you know you can really point to Jaws as as the true beginning of his career. You know he had you know another little project uh, before that, you know dealing with a car chase, and, and, I, and if I remember right, some of that footage was later used in a uh, Incredible Hulk TV episode uh, that they had as nice. leftover footage. And so if you watch that, it's like wait a wait 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 wait. That orange car is very familiar. So <laughs> Now, see, and I, of course, take offense at that opening scene for two reasons. One, as a blonde college student who spent some time in the water at night in Long Island Sound, I'm offended at the idea, and I'm glad I didn't see it because it would have freaked me out all those nights I was in the water. Um, luckily, at the time, I wasn't too worried. But two, this, of course, maybe was part of Joss Whedon's inspiration, right, for why does a cute little blonde thing always have to be the one who's attacked and killed? Wouldn't it be nice if the cute little blonde thing was the biggest, scariest thing Maybe even in the water. I bet Buffy could have taken on a great white too. So, you know, the a woman who's five four, you know, who then you know goes up against a twenty five foot shark. She's gonna be a snack, you know. No and Buffy could take it. I really, <laughs> I respectfully different disagree. It's an eating machine. That's what it's designed to do. We're not in the same habitat. It's a. Uh, it it's it doesn't end well. That's uh, and and it didn't for Chrissy Watkins, which is the kickoff for everything that happens in the story. And speaking of Steven Spielberg and all of his movies, you've said something before, and I've never noticed this that he has kind of what a theme or a, a bit that runs through a lot of his movies. A little motif, and there are many directors that <clears throat> that have this, and it's kind of their way of putting a signature in in something, and that's a shooting star. If you go back huh. and you start watching Spielberg movies, you now you can see the first shooting star in, in Jaws when they're on the orca, and it's after you know you know um, harpooning the shark with at least two of the barrels, and you know they're up by the flybridge of the um, orca, you know with the silhouette you see a shooting star go by. Oh, he did that cool. in he did that in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and you can go through and you can see his little shooting star <clears throat> signature. And so that, that's one of my things when I watch a Spielberg movie is where's the shooting star? Yeah, I'm gonna have to start but, looking for that now. 
And, you know, I don't know if he's done that, you know, consistently through all right. of them, but he did, did through all the early ones. Okay. And, uh, and I, I would hope he's, he's continued that, but I need to go back and watch everything with, with the intent of trying to find the shooting star. So there's, <laughs> there's probably a website dedicated to I'm sure know, there where, is. where each shooting star is, but it's one of his little signatures that he puts in his movies. So have you had any close encounters yourself with sharks being there, <clears throat> sailing guy near the ocean? Well, I prefer being on the water as opposed to in it. <laughs> so there, there's a big difference there. Now, have I, <clears throat> I've been to aquariums and I've seen sharks in the aquariums. I have, you know, being out on the water, you know, I've seen whales, I've seen seals, I've, I've seen everything. And then I've seen sharks a couple of times. Cool. I remember leaving Dana Point, California, bound for Catalina, and I had the con, and we were cruising along, and I look out to starboard, and just right on our starboard beam, there's a shark, and the shark turns, you know, from, you know, he's going parallel with us to, you know, being, you know, you know, basically, you know, we had crossed the T with him at that point in time. And as he turns, though, the mouth is open, and then he does a complete 180 and swims the other direction. Oh. But I thought, like, well, well, that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> I, I'm glad I saw that. Glad I was not in the water. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but no, they're, they're, they're impressive killing machines. That's, uh, there's no doubt about it. They're impressive animals. They are, and obviously lawyers office, uh, are often accused of being, you know, sharks. And uh, I actually interviewed with a firm in Dallas that not while I was interviewing with them, but earlier on, back in the heydays, crazy law firms in Dallas, they actually did have a large aquarium in their lobby where they had sharks in there. They were embracing their uh, reputation as sharks, and they were living by that, and they were proud of that reputation. Yeah, same as in, um, let's see now, Matt Damon and... The Rainmaker, uh, the sharks, or excuse me, the, the lawyer's law office and that had, you know, an aquarium with some small sharks in it. So <laughs> it's, right. uh, uh, you know, there, there are little things, uh, you know, that, that happen uh, with that. I, I don't think that's fair. Um, I, I'm very proud of our profession. I, I really don't like being accused of being, you know, that we're predators, you know, because when, when the chips are down, it's usually the lawyers are making sure things like civil rights are not trampled upon. I agree. And they, and I, I, I take offense that, you know, oh, they're just bottom feeding creatures that, you know, you know, prey upon people. You know, it's like saying doctors prey upon illness and dentists prey upon cavities. You know, when something's wrong, <laughs> uh, you go to a lawyer to, to, to make sure your life is not destroyed. So I'm, I'm a little protective of our Aww. profession. I agree with you, but I do think it's funny that uh, we're considered sharks. But hey. speaking of lawyers and sharks, so what um, what are the cases out there that address shark attacks? Have there ever been cities held responsible for a shark attack? Can a city get in trouble for a shark attack? The answer is yes. And the one case I found dealing with a shark attack is from 1976, so a year after Jaws came out. Huh. So I don't know if that had any bearing on the lawsuit. But it was in Florida. And so that starts making sense. And the case name is uh, Wamsner v. St. Petersburg. And what happened, you know, father and son are out swimming at this public beach that never had a shark attack, and the boy gets bitten by a shark. And his lifeguard gets him out of the water, shark yeah. swims away, and, you know, the, the kid's hurt, and they, they eventually sue the city town, or excuse me, the, the city was found to have no liability. And it was based upon this doctrine that the law does not require, you know, a landowner to anticipate or guard against, or uh, guard an invitee against harm from, uh, you know, wild animals unless an owner um, has brought the animal into their possession, uh, has induced the animals onto the land, um, or, or, you know, as the court boiled down, did they know about it? And in this case, you know, you had people who went into the water, so the shark's natural habitat, and they're attacked by a wild animal in the animal's natural habitat. Mm -hmm. The city had no, no warning of that. That had never happened before. Uh, they had deposition testimony from people from, you know, the you know, park services division 
you know, had been there for 20 years and they had never experienced anything like that. Lifeguard who'd worked for the city for 10 years had never seen a shark. And so it's like, okay, no liability because there was no notice. Yeah, that makes sense. On the flip side, now that there has been one, uh -huh. um, you would have to, you know, you know, put up signs, that sort of thing, because now you do have notice. Yes. So the game changes uh, after you have notice of it. One free bite, and, day, That's what you get. Basically, and you know, it's <laughs> it's very unfortunate if you're the one who got bit, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, you know, because the, the opinion also stated that like, they didn't have a duty to go out and, like, you know, conduct testing, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, now now you would, you know, and, you know, you would need to guard against shark attacks if, if you now have notice. And on the flip side of, like, if it never happens again, great. You know, it was maybe some fluke, you know, type thing that happened. Uh, but there have been other cases that I found with, like, you know, fire ants you know, and in trailer parks and in unpleasant things. And the issue is, like, did they know about it? That That's one of the, the key issues. Um, so, yeah, you know, it'd be interesting with, you know, again, it's like, you know, the alligator attacks, that sort of thing, um, which are which are tragic and, and horrible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like, so let me get this straight. You went into the swamp. <laughs> and, now and, you're upset. Was, and now you're upset that, you know, a giant animal you know attacked you mm -hmm. and what were you expecting you know yeah. at, at, the, at that point but um but that's that's more assumption of risk yeah. um issues i mean like you put up the sign it's like you know attention do not try to ride the bears you know it's like you don't <laughs> you know some things don't need to be stated but it's like that's you right. know I'm, I'm i'm gonna go tease this wild animal and see what happens and um I'm gonna rub the alligator's belly, see if that actually puts him to sleep. You know, a little. Uh, you know, the courts are testing. not sympathetic to that. Yeah, which is good. No, no, no if you're gonna be stupid, they. stupid is yeah. stupid does. Exactly. Um, I guess that whatever city it was, I'm not sure what little town it was in Cape Cod, but obviously there was that great white attack just a week ago off of the coast of Cape Cod. So, um, although I know that is an area where they've actually spotted enough great whites that. I'm assuming those cities must have to do some efforts, certainly warn beach visitors of the risk of shark attacks, maybe keep shark watches, because um, there certainly does have to be notice there now. Yeah, it, it's like swimming off California, you know, as well. You know, some of the beaches yeah. have warning signs, you know, it's, yeah. and, you know, if they've spotted them, people don't go swimming. It's just, I, you think it's common sense. Yeah. You know, you would, you would hope, but... Uh, <laughs> Common sense and reality can be often be two different things. So that's uh, that's so true. Indeed, indeed. Well, let's talk about common sense and fiction. So, how about in Jaws? Would there have been any liability for anybody, or could any of the victims uh, have been compensated for their harm or for the loss of a loved one in Jaws? The answer is yes, and it depends on the victim. Oh. And you know, if you actually go through the list, you know, you know, we we don't have negligence existing in the air or in this case, below the waves. <laughs> uh, but what happens is, let, let's look at each victim. So like Chrissy Watkins, the college girl who, you know, you know, was victim number one, her family wouldn't be able to recover. And under the same you know, logic as the Florida case, because there was no past, you know, attacks, sharks had never been seen in the area before, so thus there would be, like, no duty to go out and, and you know, go looking for sharks or, or have warnings for sharks or anything like that, because that had never happened before. So, yeah. so unfortunately for for Chrissy's family, there, there wouldn't be any recovery. Okay. And, and that's sad. Now, the second victim, second human victim... <laughs> Alex Kittner, you know, little boy, yes. God, that their family would be able to yeah. nail the, the mayor to the wall for, for that one. Because what happens between the first and second victim is the town's on notice, and you have a pathology report that says it was a shark attack, and then the pathologist changes it to say boating accident. Yeah. And, and it looks like you have the mayor willfully, you know, injecting himself getting the pathologist to change things, stopping the police chief from closing the beaches and putting up warning signs. So you have the city's active involvement, you know, mm -hmm. embodied in the mayor from stopping, you know, the police from warning people. So that, and, you know, so they're on actual notice of, of a threat. 
Uh, it looks like willful negligence. So, you know, there, there's a good chance of being able to get a gross negligence, you know, finding against them, mm -hmm. which then can open the door to punitive damages. And, you know, depending on, on how reckless it is from what you want to look at in reckless disregard of life, you might be able to, you know, have the mayor prosecuted criminally for for his involvement that led to the death of Alex Kittner. So that one is, you know, from going from like one, no recovery to most likely gross negligence is, is an extreme jump, but that's what notice gives. Yeah. Now there's a there's another victim right before the little boy. <laughs> And that's Pippet the dog. Now, you know, the, the dog was a little dog and arguably would have looked like a seal when it went oh, in the water seal. and was swimming around, which would have been, you know, the ultimate bite-sized snack for a 25-foot shark. Uh, but the dog's property. And so you have a dangerous creature that kills a domestic animal in the wild habitat when the town was on notice of the danger. I think there's a claim that could be filed there. Now, granted, it's obviously a small claim because it was a small dog. Uh, <laughs> Some of them are expensive. Uh, yeah, true, true. But, you know, we weren't looking at the $2,000 Havanese or some, you know, <laughs> poodle hybrid that could juggle. You know, this looked like a nice little mutt that liked yeah. playing in the water. And while no one likes seeing Lassie get killed, you know, I mean, like, if it had been a collie, maybe there could have been higher damages yeah. here. But, you know, if, if when with the death of the dog, you know, they should be able to recover on a destruction of property um, type theory or at least file a claim of like, dude, my dog got killed because of you. <laughs> and while getting, you know, anywhere from like, say, you know, $40 to, you know, 1000 depending on the breed or if it was a pound puppy or, or whatever, you know, there there at least be a moral victory there for Pippet the dog that, that no dog <laughs> should should fall victim to that. Now, this is, things get a little complicated here because after Kittner's death, the town, you know, a, a, basically a, a, a seagoing posse is formed to go out and do a massive shark hunt based upon the Kittner family putting out a, a you know, big reward to mm -hmm. go kill the shark. So everyone who should not go out on a boat is out, you know, and... <laughs> Second like reality and, and, show. Oh, God. I'm like, you know, and again, beautifully filmed because, you know, if you actually have any seafaring knowledge if you understand boating safety at all you just kind of cringe and it's like oh god make them stop you know for example the carrying capacity of a boat is length times beam divided by 15. so you can start going like okay if that boat is 10 feet long and five feet wide because it's, it's a nice little boat you can then figure out how many people are you know can belong in that as opposed to going like let's put 10 of them in because that's how long the boat is mm -hmm. um Great way to capsize, great way to, to you, know, you know, flounder, and for everyone to end up swimming. And, you know, guys are out there with bows and arrows and everything else, dynamite, you know. It's, <laughs> so, again, it's, it's amazing, like, no one got harpooned in the process. But one of them gets killed by the shark, and that's Ben Gardner. Now, his family shouldn't be able to recover based upon assumption of risk. Yeah. When you go out hunting a shark... That says it all. It's That's like right. so let Bad me get th things are going to happen. Let me get this straight. Your husband went out shark hunting. <laughs> End of discussion. Yeah. It's just like, and no. he was armed with dynamite, you know. And you know, you start looking at like you can you can paint, you know, a picture that they were crazy, that mm -hmm. they should not have been out on the water, and they went out to go try to kill a giant shark that obviously could kill people, mm -hmm. and uh, when. And when you're doing that, it's like, okay, we're, assumption of risk exists in, in the legal world for a reason. That's right. Which Who else brings the victims? How many victims are there in this movie? Uh, we're, we're, we're down to the last two. <laughs> there are a so, lot of victims, good lord. And so this one gets a little complicated because on the 4th of July, because the beaches stay open, because uh, a tiger shark's caught. And the mayor doesn't want to acknowledge the possibility that there could have been a different shark that, that had killed the boy and refuses to have an autopsy on it. Well, the police chief and Hooper could open the shark in the middle of the night. There's no little boy's body in said shark. And so they go out in the middle of the night and they find, you know, Ben Gardner's boat all chewed up. And Hooper goes in the water, you know, and finds a big shark tooth in the side of the boat. And as Gardner's head floats by him, he drops the shark ah. tooth because 
that's something normal anyone would do. The, you lose your sense of zen and your ability to focus uh, when, when, you know, the decapitated head floats by. Oh. And, and so when they confront the mayor with this, the mayor doesn't want to acknowledge it. And so they have additional help. So they have shark watchers, they have helicopters, there's TV coverage of all this, and people are out in the water. So with the sa sailor who's in the pond, which was supposed to be the safe little inlet, ah. um, he ends up getting killed by the shark. Interesting issues there, because you can start pointing to assumption of risk, because he's on notice of a shark in the water that's killed people, uh, but there's also you know public evidence out there that the shark's been killed, and so different things are <laughs> in play. <laughs> Uh, because because of that, so that, that's kind of a little fascinating. Now, I do think because of the cover-up factor, uh, like refusing to check, um, that you would you would have liability against the town for for the death of, of that sailor on the Fourth of July. And now, finally, you then have you know Quint, who's the grizzled shark hunter, uh, survivor on the USS Indianapolis, who's killed by the shark doing the sh sh big shark hunt and, it, and it's magnificently filmed. The, the sea hunt we're out on the orca it is fantastic visual storytelling and you know the, just the evolution of the story when they finally get out on the water it is, is jaw-dropping for, for lack of a better term and Quint takes several steps when they realize the shark's bigger than they thought it was uh, to stay out there they don't call for help when they realize they should call for help, Quint smashes the radio with a baseball bat. And when the shark finally, you know, charges the orca and and comes up over the transom, Quint ends up being a meal. Uh, and and, and, and again, Shaw does, Shaw does a wonderful, you know, wonderful, you know, portrayal of it. And, and it's a bloody, horrible death to him. But there shouldn't be any um, liability for the town. Because, again, you're going out on a shark hunt, and because of the steps that Quint took to basically interfere you know, with, with being able to call for help and call from the Coast Guard, he, his survivor shouldn't be able to um, you know, recover anything uh, for his death. Because no. he, in part, he, he created the, the dangerous situation. They yes. could have gone back, could have called for more help, they could have went, we need a bigger boat, <laughs> and then they... And they, they didn't do any of those things. So, again, little issues there. All right. So, oh, go now, ahead. Now, I, I do have one tidy discovery with this. And oh, so, yeah. uh, so, you know, a few years ago, I was, you know, right before Legal Tech New York, I went to dinner with several lead discovery attorneys and Judge Fasciola. And during dinner, and it was fascinating dinner because we're all oh, talking legal theories, legal theories and everything else. Because I mean, hey, you're round table here. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you're with the man. And, like, you know, the guy who knows what he's doing, is he's just, just an awesome guy. Well, in, in the course of the discussion with, with the storytelling, he talks about giving a speech where a painting of the USS Indianapolis was dedicated. And that there was a sailboat going by the, you know, by the ship. And since he knows about sailing and, and knew about the Indianapolis history, you know, he, he, he went and, and took the speaking invitation. Little did everyone else at the table know that I have a lot of knowledge about the loss of the Indianapolis. <laughs> so does the judge. And, you know, we start off on this very detailed discussion about the sinking of the Indianapolis, the, the court-martial of Captain McVeigh, and, and the other lawyers are just sitting around the table going like, what's happening here? What happened you know, how to our we... dinner? <laughs> Why do these guys know so much about this? Is probably a, a better question. And and you know, again, talking about you know the captain being court-martialed, how he you know committed suicide, and and his son's efforts to you know get his name cleared because you know other captains you know lost their ships during World War II. I mean, you know, President Kennedy got run over by a destroyer, and you know, and you know, no repercussions there. And, you know, McVeigh, after delivering the atomic bomb uh, to Tinian Delay, uh, cruising home, was sunk by a Japanese submarine I-58. And they actually had the Japanese submarine captain 
at the court martial wow. uh, of the U.S. captain. So it was one of this weird situation of, you know, you know, we had won the war, yeah, and and then we we have the Japanese captain coming in to, you know, it was very weird. It was absolutely oh. very, weird. but. Yeah, well, of the, course, the sinking you said had resulted in what? How many men dying in the water? Um, when they get sunk, twelve hundred men go in the water, and this is a super secret mission. You know, yeah. they, you know, they had orders to put the, you know, if they got torpedoed, they had orders to put the atomic bomb in a lifeboat before anyone else, and so it was actually welded to the deck of the hold, and so this was a heavy cruiser, and so they deliver it safely, and they're going home. And there was no evidence of Japanese submarines in the area, so they weren't doing a zigzag course. And, you know, I-58 comes along, and, and to the captain's credit, uh, he did not use his Keichin torpedoes, which are, you know, the human-guided ones that the Japanese had. And so it was the underwater kamikaze. And uh, he sank them with, with traditional torpedoes. And 1,200 men go on the water, and 316 are picked up several days later. The rest being eaten by sharks, and then I'm sure the horrific nature of the incident had a lot to do with the court martial. Obviously, I mean that's that's. I mean, I can't believe that's a horror movie right there. Oh, it was, it was utterly horrific, and you know, and there are other stories of U.S. sailors going in the water during World War II, and sharks were the common enemy of, of everyone who yeah. ended up in the water. I believe a uh, battle of, battle of Samar, uh, last stand of the tin can sailors after the. Um, uh, Samuel B. Roberts is sunk. That those men, um, you know, had had fought off sharks. If I if I remember that correctly, so. Um, but very... tying this back into Jaws, <laughs> yeah. for those of us who haven't seen the movie, there was a discussion of this sinking, right? That was what. Yeah. Uh, with yeah, Quint, is it Quint? Quint is you know a survivor off the Indianapolis. So I while see. They're, while they're drinking on the orca after you know the first day of the hunt. Um, there's a discussion about scars, which then leads to tattoos, and, you know, when Hooper makes a joke about, like, oh, did that one say mom? And to which, you know, Quint replies, Mr. Hooper, that's the USS Indianapolis, and, and Hooper goes quiet, and, and Brody wants to know what's going on. Ah. And Quint, and, and, you know, and Shaw does magnificent portrayal, just this powerful storytelling about, you know, men being eaten alive. Uh, being in the water, and it was, I mean, just horrific, and it's its some of the best movie making out there, because it, it's a its a true story, and you know, it, it helped get, get the message out, this was only a couple years after um, McVeigh killed himself, too, and and so I think that was early 70s when, when, he, when he killed himself, and uh, too many letters accusing him of, of getting kids killed yeah and oh, that's and a lot of weight to carry oh and it wasn't wasn't his fault I know it took decades it was either end of Clinton administration or beginning of Bush uh, when uh, his well, Bush 43 when when uh, you know McVeigh's name was finally cleared now and he did become an admiral and 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 so he, he did have a very long distinguished career but that was a multi-generational naval family yeah and and like with with you know everybody being an Annapolis grad for at least three generations, and um, just just again a horrible ending, and the film Jaws does a wonderful portrayal of of the horrors they endured, and then I've read books about it, and, and apparently so is Judge Fasciola. Well, there you go. And, Tying and it all together. One, wonderful dinner conversation that confused everyone else there, and with the like, how do you two know this? <gasps> Why do you two remember this? You know, type. Uh, type That's thing. pretty memorable. So it it is, and uh, but again, then I'm also do history, so right. it's uh, it, it's what I do. Well, see, on this cheery note, this is exactly why I don't watch movies like Jaws um, or the real life <laughs> war stories. They're all far too depressing and scary, and I don't do that. So on that cheery note, we're going to end with a reminder to everyone, be careful if you happen to be swimming in an ocean. I'm going to stick to the lakes here in Wisconsin, where I only have to worry about a hungry northerner muskie taking a chunk out of me. Josh, I don't know if you plan to stay above water up there on uh, the Pacific coast, but be safe. Don't take any small boats either. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, one exercise is due caution. And uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't have a SEAL outfit, so that's also a perk. <laughs> that's so, good. Uh, that's a good safety measure. 
Exactly, but this has been fun discussing the liability of the town of Amity and uh, Mayor Vaughn. And um, thank you, everyone. Yes, thanks, everyone. Be safe out there in the water and uh, enjoy this episode, and we'll see you 